This is chapter four, chemical reactions of organic molecules. So there are four basic types of organic reaction mechanisms. Substitution, addition, elimination, and rearrangement. You can see that in a substitution that one group is replaced with another. So the OH group on the reactant side has been replaced by a CL group in the product side. In addition, um, you can see that there's a double bond, and the double bond reacts with um, some reagent, Br2 in this case, to add a bromine across each of the atoms in the double bond. So those atoms have been added to, the bromine atoms have been added to the molecule. Elimination is kind of the reverse of uh, addition. You can see that in elimination, we have removed at least that OH group, but we've also removed an H that's on the neighboring atom. So um, we have removed the H and the OH, which makes a molecule of water, and that leaves us with a double bond. So elimination is the reverse of addition. And finally, a rearrangement reaction is one where uh, one group on a molecule kind of moves to another part of the molecule. So it's hard to recognize in this last example here, but the uh, carbon on the right has three methyl groups attached to it on, in, the in the reactant side, and on the product side, there's two methyl groups attached to that carbon because one methyl group has migrated next door, it has, that, so that molecule has rearranged. So um, when we look at chemical reactions, we try to um, look at every individual step that occurs in terms of bonds forming and bonds breaking uh, during the progress of turning reactants into products. So those steps are generally achieved in two different ways. One is when um, a, we have what's called a, a heterolytic bond cleavage. And that's where the bond breaks and both electrons go to one atom. So two electrons move at the same time and they both go the same direction. So uh, we can see here in this, rea in this example that's given, there's um, atom A bonded to atom B, uh, those two electrons. And when the bond breaks, the two electrons are given to B. And ions result from this. And that gives us a plus charge on A and a minus charge on B. Um, another example down below is uh, the breaking of the bond between carbon and chlorine, which gives us a carbocation and a chloride ion. In homolytic, homolytic bond cleavage, uh, the bond breaks um, symmetrically, and one electron in the bond goes to the atom on the right side, and the other electron in the bond goes to the atom on the left side. So you can see that in that first example there, again, we have A and B bonded together with two electrons between. But this time, instead of both electrons going toward B, one electron goes toward A and one electron goes toward B. And so in this case, rather than having um, charged particles at the end because uh, one atom has lost electrons and the other atom has gained electrons, so we have ions that result, in this case, since each atom gets one electron and each atom brought one electron into the bond, what results are neutral particles. Those A and B are neutral. They don't have a charge, uh, but they do have an unpaired electron. And that unpaired electron is called a free radical. And free radicals are very unstable and very reactive. And so a specific example we can see below is two chlorine atoms bonded together with those two electrons um, in the bond and those arrows representing one electron going toward the atom on the right and one electron going toward the atom on the left and that gives us two chloride radicals um, where those chlorine atoms now have seven electrons and chlorine's valence has seven electrons and we see its position on the periodic table so that indicates that chlorine is neutral it doesn't have a formal charge uh, when it has that unpaired electron, but unpaired electrons are very reactive because they want to pair up. Paired electrons are stable, unpaired electrons are unstable. So you may have noticed in that previous slide that when we're, when we're dealing with um, arrows and mechanisms where two electrons go the same direction, um, as in heterolytic bond cleavage, then we use 
uh, a, a notation that's called a full arrow. And you can see that this arrow has two heads basically on it. So there's kind of a, a two-headed point at the tip of this arrow. And we can contrast that with the fish hook arrow on the other side that kind of has only one head, if you will. So it kind of looks like a fish hook. And so um, these two different um, notations are used to represent the different number of electrons that move in a mechanism. So when two electrons are moving, we use the full arrow that has two heads representing two electrons. And when one electron is moving, we use the fish hook arrow that only has one head to represent the one electron. So we briefly looked at a, an example of arrow pushing um, when we looked at acids and bases. And we showed that uh, a base, for example, has a pair of electrons, and those electrons are used to form a bond between the base electrons and the acidic proton on the acid. And that also then breaks the bond between that acidic proton and the conjugate base. And so um, there are two arrows that are required in this mechanism, the arrow from the base to the proton that forms the new bond, and the arrow from the old bond between the, um, the proton and the oxygen atom that shows the formation of a new lone pair on the oxygen atom. So what we see is that that, that first arrow between nitrogen and hydrogen, that represents two electrons moving, and the two electrons are those that are right there in that lone pair on nitrogen. So the arrow starts where the electrons start at that lone pair right there on that nitrogen atom and the the arrow points to the atom that's getting attacked if you will or the the positive side of this reaction so electrons are negative and the other side has some positive character which is why the electrons are attacking that that uh, that location on the molecule so um, it's always, we always show the movement of electrons when we're drawing a mechanism. And so it's important to always start the arrow where the electrons start. So notice how the uh, electrons, that lone pair, the arrow starts on the lone pair on the left, and then the other arrow starts right at the bond in between O and H. And remember those bonds, those sticks in between the molecules in between the atoms there represent electrons that are holding those atoms together. So that bond in between O and H consists of two electrons, and so the arrow starts at the bond, and the arrow is then pointing toward the oxygen atom, which represents where the electrons are going to go. So if we look at the, um, on the left side, the, the arrow is pointing at the oxygen atom, indicating that those electrons in the bond are going to end up on the oxygen atom. And indeed, when we look at the right, that oxygen atom now has an extra lone pair, and that has given it a formal charge of negative one. So the fish hook arrows are a little bit different. So um, bonds consist of two electrons. So when we're using the full arrow, we show the arrow start at a pair of electrons and where it ends is where that pair of electrons ends up. But with fish hook arrows, um, each fish hook arrow only represents one electron but each bond consists of two electrons. So in order to show something happen with fish hook arrows, we have to use two arrows at a time generally. So for example, um, this, first, this first example on top shows two methyl radicals, so a CH3 with one unpaired electron, and there are two of those. And so when we show those two fish hook arrows that are the arrow starts at the uh, electron, at the unpaired electron, and so we see that each of these arrows is starting at the unpaired electron, and then they're curved and they kind of point at each other. When those two single fish hook arrows point at each other like that, that indicates that those two electrons are coming together to make a bond. So you can see on the left, we have two unpaired electrons that are pointing toward each other with these arrows. And on the right, there's a new bond and those radicals are gone because they are now inside of that bond. That bond represents two electrons, those two radicals. So this is how we represent bond formation when we're using fish hook arrows, when we're showing a radical mechanism involving unpaired electrons where one electron is moving at a time. Now this only happens, we only use fish hook arrows when we're looking at radical mechanisms. And radical mechanisms are not particularly common in organic chemistry. So this is kind of
an uncommon case where we use fishhook arrows, but we're going to see an example like that in this chapter, and we're going to use some fishhook arrows in this example. Um, but as we go on, we will more often than not use the full arrows. And so it's important to recognize that we only use fishhook arrows when we're talking about a radical mechanism. Um, and now in the, the example on the bottom, we see this bromine. And here we have a bond in between the two bromine atoms. And that bond represents two electrons. And when we want to show that bond breaking apart, but we're showing it uh, in a homolytic cleavage so that it's part of a radical mechanism, then we need to show two arrows because each fishhook arrow only represents one electron. And so the opposite of bond formation, where we show the arrows coming together to form a bond, when we show a bond being cleaved, we show the arrows coming apart. So it's kind of a, a subtle difference, noticing that the arrows are either pointing toward each other or they're pointing away from each other. But that is how you indicate whether a bond is being formed by two unpaired electrons or whether a bond is breaking apart, forming two unpaired electrons or two radicals. So notice that the bromine has no radicals on the left, it just has that covalent bond. But when that bond breaks, we form two new radicals on the right. So these are, these are the opposite of each other. You can see the two radicals forming a bond or the bond forming the two radicals. So here's an example um, of in a mechanism where we might see these fishhook arrows being used to show a bond being formed. So if we have a radical, an unpaired electron on a carbon atom, and we have an unpaired electron on a chlorine atom, then we can represent those two unpaired electrons coming together to make a bond by showing fishhook arrows that each start at the unpaired electron, and then they point toward each other to represent a bond being formed in between those two atoms. So we can see on the left, they're unpaired, and then the arrows point at each other. And on the right, the bond has been formed in between the C and the CL there. So this first reaction that we're going to look at is called uh, the chlorination of methane. And methane, uh, as you're aware, is a meth stands for one carbon, and the ane stands for single bond. So it's one carbon that has four covalent bonds uh, to hydrogen. And um, in this case, when it reacts with a chlorine molecule, then we can replace one of those hydrogen atoms with a chlorine atom. So remember, when we looked at the, the types of reactions at the beginning of this lecture, substitution was the first one. Well, this is a substitution reaction. One of those H's is being substituted for a chlorine atom. And you can see that, in fact, the chlorine, one of the H's has substituted the chlorine on the chlorine molecule. You can see that the H and the Cl have switched places in these two molecules. So this reaction uh, doesn't necessarily just put one chlorine, doesn't just replace one hydrogen with one chlorine. If we let the reaction keep going, we keep reacting these two molecules together, then we can replace two hydrogen atoms with chlorine, or three hydrogen atoms with chlorine, or all four hydrogen atoms with chlorine. Um, but heat or light is needed in each step. So if we just put the Cl2 together with methane, and we don't have heat or light, then this reaction does not occur. So for some reason, heat and light, heat or light, is required to cause this reaction to occur, to start. So this, this brings up a couple of questions about how this reaction occurs. So first, why is light or heat needed for the reaction to start? Um, why do we get a mixture of products? Why is it that the, the chlorine atom could replace one or two or three or all four of the hydrogen atoms? Um, and we might ask, are the observed products formed because they're the most stable possible products? Or is it because they're formed faster than any other products? So those are generally two different ways that um, products might accumulate in an organic reaction. They might accumulate because they're the most stable product, or they might accumulate because they form very quickly. So three different ways that we can investigate this question. 
is uh, the first is through the mechanism. And so the mechanism is the complete step-by-step -step description of exactly which bonds break and which bonds form and in what order to give the observed products. So often when we're looking at a chemical reaction, um, we kind of simplify things and we show that A plus B goes to C and we make some product C. But um, in, in reality, often that process is much more complicated than just A plus B making C. So often A plus B will make some intermediate, you know, we'll call it B prime, and then that can make a second intermediate, and that can make another intermediate, and those intermediates don't last very long, but they're important steps along the way between A and B becoming C. And so they're not really seen at the end of the reaction because by the time the reaction ends, all of those intermediates have usually been converted into either product or byproduct. Um, but it, it's important that uh, when we're trying to understand how a reaction occurs, it's important that we really investigate all of the steps, even the ones that aren't necessarily apparent at the end of the reaction when we just look at the products. Um, we can also investigate a reaction according to thermodynamics, which is the study of the energy changes that accompany chemical and physical transformations. So um, generally when we use thermodynamics, we're trying to get some understanding of the relative stability of the reactants and products. So are the bonds stronger or weaker in the products, or are they stronger or weaker in the reactants? And what effect does that have on which direction the reaction is going to move? Um, and finally, we use kinetics to look at reaction rates, um, and this is to, in, to determine how, how quickly reactions move. So thermodynamics might tell us um, which product is more stable or which of the uh, components in a reaction is more stable, which might tell us which direction a reaction might move, um, but it doesn't tell us how quickly that will happen. So kinetics is the, the study that really tells us how quickly reactions occur. Um, so that will help us determine which products are formed the fastest. Um, and it, kinetics also helps to predict how the rate will change if we change the reaction conditions. So um, the chlorination of methane does not occur at room temperature in the absence of light. The reaction begins when light falls on the mixture or when it is heated. Thus, we know that this reaction requires some form of energy to initiate it. The most effective wavelength of light is a blue color that is strongly absorbed by chlorine gas. This finding implies that absorbing light activates the chlorine molecule in some way so that it initiates the reaction with methane. And finally, three, the light-initiated reaction has a high quantum yield. This means that many molecules of the product are formed for every photon of light absorbed. Um, so when we're trying to determine exactly how this reaction occurs, we before we know anything, we just make observations. And so these might be some of the observations that we would make if we didn't understand much about this mechanism. We would just start making observations about the conditions necessary for the reaction to move forward. So here's uh, what we know about the reaction, that um, in this chlorination of methane, we react one molecule of methane with a molecule of chlorine, and the H and the Cl seem to change places. A substitution reaction occurs. And this only happens in the presence of heat or light. So uh, the type of reaction that can um, fit all these observations that we uh, made before, uh, that um, the reaction doesn't occur at room temperature in the absence of light, it seems to need something to initiate it, what seems to initiate it is uh, something that affects the chlorine atom. And finally, that um, one mechanism, or excuse me, that many molecules of the product can be formed for every photon of light absorbed, that high quantum yield that we mentioned in the last slide, that indicates uh, what's called a free radical chain reaction. So there are three steps in a free radical chain reaction. The initiation step, which generates a reactive intermediate, the propagation steps, in which the reactive intermediate reacts with a stable molecule to form a product and another reactive intermediate, allowing the chain to continue until the supply of reactants is exhausted.
or the reactive intermediate is destroyed. And three, termination steps. Side reactions that destroy reactive intermediates and tend to slow or stop the reaction. So we're going to look at each one of these three steps in detail in the mechanism of the chlorination of methane. So the first step is the initiation. So um, this is why it seemed that the reaction wouldn't occur without heat or light, and that uh, light specifically that was absorbed by the chlorine seemed to have um, a, an effect a very strong effect on the reaction between these two molecules. So what's happening here is that when we use uh, light of a certain wavelength, it can excite the chlorine molecule, and that can break the bond between the chlorine atoms, uh, make a homolytic bond cleavage, and when we break that bond in that fashion, we create two radicals. So what's important to recognize about an initiation step is that on the reactant side, you don't have any radicals because in order for a free radical mechanism, a free radical chain reaction to occur, there has to be radicals. So before initiation occurs, there are not any radicals. There are zero radicals on the reactant side. And after the initiation step occurs, then we have two radicals because we have gone from some neutral molecule on the left, chlorine in this case, and then when it breaks, when that bond breaks homolytically and it gives one electron to each side, we have created two radicals, two unpaired electrons. So the initiation step starts with zero radicals and ends with two radicals. Um, Notice that when we're drawing the chlorine radical, we just put one electron on there to focus on the radical nature of that atom, uh, even though it's true that chlorine has three other lone pairs, right? So a chlorine atom has seven valence electrons, same with bromine. So when we look at these Lewis structures, we notice that they have these lone pairs, but remember that the lone pairs tend to be pretty stable and therefore pretty unreactive. So what we want to focus on is the reactive part of these structures. So even though the Lewis structure of a chlorine atom has seven electrons, when we write the uh, chlorine atom for a radical mechanism, we just draw one electron on it. Those two structures are equivalent. The chlorine atom with one electron and the chlorine atom with seven electrons are the same because we're implying when that one on the bottom, the, when we're saying written, we're implying those three lone pairs are there. We're just not drawing them because organic chemists are lazy and we're just trying to save time. And also we're trying to focus on the important part of the reaction, which is that single unpaired electron. So just recognize that when we're drawing these, uh, uh, some of these radicals, that we're only focusing on the unpaired electron, even though the, those pairs of electrons are still there. So um, this is, uh, true especially for the halogens because they have those unpaired electrons and this hydroxyl radical here so notice that in a hydroxyl radical that oxygen has two pairs of electrons but when we draw the radical we're only drawing the one unpaired electron and we imply that the other two are there all right so after we have initiation and we have now formed two radicals. So the chlorine atom, or excuse me, the, the molecule of chlorine, Cl2, that bond has broken homolytically uh, because it absorbed some photon of the right wavelength. And so that has created two radicals. And now there are radicals in the reaction. And those radicals are very, very reactive. So they're going to react with something right away. And since there's lots of methane floating around in this reaction, one of those radicals is going to bump into a methane molecule and it's going to react with methane. And so in this step, this is called a propagation step. And in a propagation step, what's important to notice is that on the reactant side, we have one uh, radical and on the product side, we have one radical. So in the initiation step, the, the reaction can't start until we create radicals. So we go from zero radicals to two radicals. And in a propagation step, what we're doing is we're continuing the reaction. We're moving the reaction forward. So we have a radical on the left, 
and we still have a radical on the right. So the reaction doesn't stop. We haven't used up our radicals. In the process of this propagation step, we've created another radical. We used one radical and we created another. So the reaction can continue. That new radical that we've created on the product side can go and do the next step, can go and also propagate the next step and create another radical and so on. And that one can create another radical. That's the chain reaction nature of this reaction. A chain reaction is one in which the uh, products of the, the previous step become the reactants for the next step and so on and so on and so on. And so we can see here in this first propagation step, we have a chlorine radical and that's reacting with a molecule of methane. Now notice that there are three electrons moving in the step. There are three fish hook arrows. So this is a complicated step. There are two things happening with those three fish hook arrows. Two of those arrows are being used to indicate a bond formation. So you can see that two of those arrows are coming together. That indicates that a bond is being formed and generally we draw those two arrows coming together in the middle of the two atoms that are going to have a new bond. So in this case, notice that those two arrows coming together are kind of in between the H and the CL. Well, that's because we're forming a bond between H and CL. You can see that on the right side of the reaction there. But what's complicated about this one is that one of those arrows that's being used to form the bond is also involved in the step on the left where there are two arrows coming apart to indicate a bond cleavage. So notice that we have a bond formation and a bond cleavage in the same step here. So the bond cleavage shows two arrows coming away. They're both starting at the bond between C and H and they're coming apart. So as they come apart like that, that indicates that that bond is breaking homolytically. One of the electrons is going to carbon and one of the electrons is going to the other half of that bond, which is H. But instead of H just holding on to that electron and becoming a radical, it instantly uses that electron to form a bond with the Cl on the other side. So let's, let's go through that again. The, the, atom, the, elect, the arrow on the far left that is pointing toward carbon ends up as a radical on that carbon atom. We can see that on the right side. The second arrow is leaving the CH bond and it's pointing in between the H and the Cl. Well, that arrow is representing an electron that belongs to hydrogen. Hydrogen is going to immediately use that electron to form a bond between itself and Cl, and that's indicated by those two arrows coming together. And we can see that in the structure on the right. The H and the Cl have a new bond between them. So in this second propagation step, notice again, we can tell if I ask you, if I give you a reaction, a step like this, and ask you, is this an initiation step or is this a propagation step? How would you be able to tell that this reaction right here is a propagation step? Well, you would look and count the number of radicals on the left side. There's one. And you'd count the number of radicals on the right side. There's one. So a propagation step is when I have a radical in the reactant and a radical in the product. So this would be a propagation step. That's different from an initiation step because remember, initiation has zero radicals on the left and two radicals on the right. So in this second propagation step, again, this is a complicated step. We have three arrows. So this is just like the one before. And that the three arrows, it's important that I have three because that means that two of these arrows can neutralize that radical and make a new bond. But then that one odd man out, that last arrow, the third arrow, is what leaves us with a radical on the other side. So having three electrons move in this reaction, the odd number of electrons, is what allows us to both make a bond and also make a radical at the same time. So both propagation steps, the last one and this, or the, the first propagation step, I should say, and the second propagation step that we're looking at now, both involve three single electrons moving at the same time. They both involve a bond formation and a bond cleavage, and they both leave us with a radical in the product side. So notice that the methyl radical that we're starting with here 
is the product of the last step. So that first propagation step creates a methyl radical. And in the second propagation step, we're going to use that methyl radical to make a product, um, one molecule of chloromethane and also one chlorine radical. Now notice that once we have made that chlorine radical on the right side, now that chlorine radical can start this whole process all over again because the chlorine radical is what started that first propagation step. So in this, at the end of the second propagation step, I've made another chlorine radical, and it can go around in a circle and start the first propagation step with a new molecule of methane. So that's the nature of the chain reaction, uh, the, the chain nature of this reaction, I should say, where, where the product of one reaction becomes the reactant of the next reaction. So uh, the difference here is that rather than... Um, reacting with a neutral molecule of methane, we're reacting with a methyl radical and a neutral molecule of chlorine. And so that's going to give us a bond between C and Cl. You notice those two fish hook arrows coming together, and they're coming together in the middle of the C and the Cl, and that indicates a new bond being formed between C and Cl, and we can see that on the product side. And then we see the bond cleavage step we see two arrows coming away from each other and they start at that bond between the Cl atoms. So the arrow on the far right is pointing at the chlorine on the far right and it ends up as a radical and that's that radical atom that we see on the product side of this reaction. But the other arrow in that bond cleavage step is kind of really long and rather than just ending up right on chlorine and chlorine becoming a second radical, it immediately uses that electron and it makes a bond with the chlorine, or excuse me, with the carbon atom on the other side. So generally in a radical reaction, that first propagation step and second propagation step will just keep occurring um, and using up reactant molecules, using up methane molecules over and over and over again uh, until all the methane runs out and then the reaction would be over and you would have converted all of your reactant into product. Um, and so those propagation steps are uh, help the reaction move forward um, and they're favorable steps. And um, sometimes we get a different kind of reaction with those radicals and that is not a productive step. It doesn't necessarily lead to products, um, but it might. Uh, and what it definitely does though is decrease the number of radicals in the reaction, excuse me, and that um, as we decrease the number of radicals in the reaction, then the reaction slows down and eventually stops. So these reactions are called termination reactions. And notice that the important thing here that you can distinguish these reactions from the previous two types that we talked about is that in this case we have two radicals on the left and zero radicals on the right. So in a termination step, we, are, we end with no radicals. When there are no radicals left, when there are zero radicals, the reaction cannot continue because the reaction needs those radicals. And remember, in order to get the radicals, we have to use light or heat to make them. So when they're all gone, if there's no more light or heat left, then the reaction is over. So a termination reaction takes two radicals, any two, and it combines them together uh, to make a bond and then on the product side, we have no radicals left, and so the chain reaction stops. So the two kinds of radicals we've seen so far are a methyl radical and a chlorine radical. So here are a couple of different ways, three different ways that these different radicals can join up in a termination reaction. We can have a methyl radical and a chlorine radical, and that makes a molecule of product. So that's a productive termination step, at least the reaction doesn't continue because we use up some uh, of the radicals, but we did make a molecule of product. The chlorine can, uh, one chlorine radical can react with another chlorine radical to make a molecule of chlorine. Well, that just takes our initiation step in reverse, so that's not necessarily productive. Um, and finally, we could have two methyl radicals that bump into each other and make a molecule of ethane. And this is also not necessarily a productive reaction because we're trying to make chloromethane, that first molecule on top, and making ethane is just a byproduct. So we've just wasted some of our 
methane to create ethane, which is an unwanted byproduct in this case. So those termination steps kind of get in the way of a productive reaction. Other ways that uh, of these radicals can be used up, because remember, radicals are really, really reactive. So if radicals are in some container, not only are they going to react with the solvent molecules and the reagent molecules that are in that container, they're going to react with the container itself because the container is made of atoms and the, the radicals are just as reactive to the atoms in the container as they are to the atoms in solution. So as uh, radicals collide with the wall of the container, they can also just get stuck to whatever atoms are in the wall of the container. We just left it blank as wall here, but you know, if it's glass, it could be silicon or oxygen or boron, potentially, depending on the type of glass. Um, and so these radicals would, could stick to the atoms in the vessel. So in addition to investigating a reaction in terms of its mechanism, its step-by-step -step electron mechanism like we just looked at, um, we can also look at the thermodynamics of the reaction. And so when we take um, a, a thermodynamic approach to investigating a reaction, we're really looking at the relative stability of the reactants and products in terms of their bond strength. Are, are the bonds stronger or weaker in the products or in the reactants? So... Um, Equilibrium is one component of this investigation. Uh, we can look at an equilibrium constant, which of course is the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants, um, which has uh, uh, necessitates the stoichiometric coefficients in there as well, as you can see here, where the little lowercase a, b, c, and d are components of that equilibrium constant, as you recall from Gen Chem. So if we place, if we look at the reaction that we've been investigating, the chlorination of methane. So now we have CH4 plus C, a molecule of chlorine makes chloromethane plus HCl. So what the, one of those H's and Cl have swapped places in the substitution reaction. If we place these uh, reactants and products in here and we calculate the equilibrium product, or excuse me, the equilibrium constant at equilibrium, we see that it is a very large number, 1.1 times 10 to the 19th. So this means that essentially all of those reactants have been converted to product. Uh, if we were to put a percentage to it, it would be something like 99.9999999, many, many nines. It's, it, it is essentially every single one of those molecules has been converted to product. Now, of course, not every single one. There are a few, but it's the, the ratio is like a trillion to one or something. It's a huge number. So what that number tells us, that huge number that there are so many more products than there are reactants, that tells us that the products are more stable than the reactants. That gives us some indication of the strength of the bonds in the reactants and the products. That means that, not that, that, that the, the, re, the bonds in the product are stronger than the bonds in the reactant were. So that CH bond is not as strong as the CCL bond, and the CLCL bond on the, on the left side is not as strong as the HCL bond. So those bonds have become stronger when they swapped places. Uh, in addition to the equilibrium constant, we can also look at the free energy of the reactants and products. And so um, the free energy is really just another way of uh, of indicating which direction a reaction is likely to go uh, spontaneously. So which does it move spontaneously toward reactants or does it move spontaneously toward products? Um, this is really the same information that we're getting from the equilibrium constant, but uh, it's often easier to measure the free energy. So um, we often use free energy in order to get at the same information, which direction does a reaction go spontaneously. So um, you may recall from Gen Chem that uh, we can 
we can calculate the equilibrium constant with the concentrations and stoichiometric coefficients as we saw on the previous slide and we can also calculate the equilibrium constant as a function of the free energy as we see here um, the equilibrium constant equals e to the negative change in the standard free energy divided by the gas constant times the temperature uh, or rearranged um, the free energy delta g equals negative RT ln K. So again, essentially what this is telling us is what I was getting at with the equilibrium constant. When we see that the equilibrium constant is a very large number, it indicates that most of the reactants have been converted to product. Um, and delta G gives us uh, that similar information. So if delta G is positive, then that shows us that um, we can convert very few of the reactants to products. In fact, uh, most of the reaction stays as reactants. If we only converted 17% to products, that means that 83% remained reactant. So when delta G equals zero, we get 50-50, which is the same as saying the equilibrium constant is equal to one. When the equilibrium constant is equal to one, we have products over reactants, and products and reactants must be the same if the equilibrium constant equals 1. So delta G equals 0 is the same thing as saying the equilibrium constant equals 1, which means the likelihood of us converting reactant to product is 50%. As that number gets more and more negative, as delta G gets more and more negative, then the conversion to products gets larger and larger and larger which is another way of saying as the equilibrium constant gets larger and larger and larger, the conversion to products gets larger and larger and larger. So they're just two different ways of getting at the same idea, which is how likely are we to convert reactant to product? And that's a function of how stable the reactants are versus the products. At equilibrium, we're going to end up at the place that's the most stable. And so if the products are most stable, then it will be easy to convert reactants to products. If the products are less stable, then it's not easy to convert reactants to products. So another component of thermodynamic analysis is looking at the enthalpy and the entropy. And so you, again, may recall from Gen Chem that uh, the free energy is a function of the enthalpy and the entropy in this fashion that the change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy equals the free energy, the change in free energy. So um, it's, it, it's important for us to look at how enthalpy and entropy relate to organic reactions in this context.
so um, again, I just wanted to look at this homolytic cleavage step. So if we have two atoms that are bonded together with those two electrons, A and B, and a homolytic cleavage, one electron goes to A and one electron goes to B. So we can call this the bond dissociation enthalpy, and this is often how we measure bond strength. So when we're trying to say what is the strength of a bond between carbon and carbon, the reaction that we'll look at to measure that strength is one of these homolytic cleavage reactions where we're breaking the bond symmetrically and each half gets one electron. So for example, the uh, bond dissociation enthalpy of a chlorine molecule is positive 242 kilojoules per mole. So all we're doing in this reaction is breaking a bond. And since the only thing we're doing is breaking a bond, then the only thing we're doing is absorbing energy. So delta H is always positive for bond dissociation enthalpy because we're, the only thing that we do in this mechanism here is break a bond. You can see in the homolytic cleavage, there are two arrows indicating a bond being broken and no arrows indicating a bond being formed. So homolytic cleavage is always associated with absorbing energy because a bond is being broken. So it always has a positive delta H. Here we can see in this table um, many different values of bond dissociation enthalpies for different bonds. So again, these are all measured by showing the bond between two atoms breaking and each half of the bond getting one electron. So for example, the HH bond in the top has a bond association enthalpy of 436 kilojoules per mole, which is fairly high, um, but not quite as high as HF, for example, 570 kilojoules per mole. Um, and you can see some of these other values, for example, bonds to secondary carbons and bonds to tertiary carbons and how that changes the bond association enthalpy. So you can see that the bond association enthalpy between a carbon on a secondary carbon to a hydrogen is 413 kilojoules per mole, but the bond to a tertiary carbon is 403. So the bond to a secondary carbon is somehow more stable. At 413, it takes more energy to break that than the bond to a tertiary carbon at 403 kilojoules per mole. So um, not that you have to know these values. Um, we're not even going to really do much calculation with these values at all. If you are to calculate with these values, you can always, you'll always have access to this table. Um, but this is more or less just to show that different kinds of bonds have different kinds of stabilities associated with them. Some bonds are very stable, like HF. Some bonds are very unstable, like II. So look at II, that has a very low value, which means it's very easy to break the II bond, but HF has a very high value, which means it's very hard to break the HF bond. So this is just to show you the relative strength of some different bonds. So what we can do with this table of values is we can calculate the delta H or the change in enthalpy for a reaction and remember, the change in enthalpy, if it's positive, that indicates an endothermic reaction. And if it's negative, that indicates an exothermic reaction. So we can look up the bond association enthalpies in a table, like the table that we just had. And so for any theoretical reaction that we're interested in, we can use these values from the tables here and determine whether our reaction will be endothermic or exothermic. So the way that we would do that is just by um, adding up the bond association enthalpy of the reactants and the bond dissociation enthalpy of the products, and we would subtract the product from the reactant. So here is an example of that uh, being done. So for example, we see on the left there are bonds being broken. We have a chlorine and a chlorine and that value uh, when we break that bond is 240 kilojoules per mole and the uh, CH3, the carbon-hydrogen bond in methane is 439 kilojoules per mole. 
So the bonds being broken, if we add up those two numbers from a table, we would say that it takes 679 kilojoules per mole to break those bonds in the reactants. But when we form the bonds in the products, we form a bond between carbon and chlorine, and we form a bond between hydrogen and chlorine. When we form the HCl bond, we get negative 432 kilojoules per mole, which is the amount released, which is just the, we take that value from the table, and instead of breaking that value, now we're forming it, so it's just that number in reverse, it's the negative, we take that number and multiply it by negative one, so in this case it's negative 432 kilojoules, and the bond between carbon and chlorine, negative 350 kilojoules, so when the energy that is released from forming these bonds is negative 782 kilojoules. So we compare the amount of energy it took to break the bonds, which was 679 kilojoules, with the amount of energy that we get back that we release when we form the bonds, which is 782 kilojoules, and it turns out that delta H, when we sum those two together, is negative 103 kilojoules per mole. So it shows that this reaction is exothermic uh, with a quantity of negative 103 kilojoules per mole. So we got, there was more energy released when we formed these strong bonds than there was when we broke the weaker bonds on the reactant side, is how we could interpret this number. So we can look at this not only as the entire reaction as we just did, um, looking at the, the reactants and products in the full reaction, but we could also look at this mechanistically step by step and show that in the first step, we're breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond and we're forming a hydrogen-chlorine bond. And so in that first propagation step, that step is actually endothermic. So converting a chlorine radical to a methane radical essentially is what, is what we're doing in that first step is endothermic by plus seven kilojoules per mole. But in the second propagation step, we're taking that methane radical and reacting it with a chlorine molecule to make our product, chloromethane, and a chlorine radical. And that step is very exothermic uh, with a magnitude of negative 110 kilojoules per mole. So when we add those two steps together, the positive seven kilojoules per mole and the negative 110, we get that same value that we computed on the previous slide which shows that it doesn't matter if we look at the entire reaction as, a, as overall, we would compute a change in enthalpy of negative 103 kilojoules per mole, or if we look at the reaction mechanistically step by step, as we've just done here, broken it down in terms of each mechanistic step, we still get the same value when we uh, compute this number either way. And one last thing to point out here um, in the enthalpy is to recognize that the first propagation step has us um, forming a methane radical. And that's an endothermic step, and it's uh, endothermic with a magnitude of 7 kilojoules per mole. Um, there's an alternative way that we could potentially write this mechanism, and that would be that instead of in this first step forming a methane radical, in this first step we could form a hydrogen radical. So uh, it's, it's kind of ambiguous how these reactants are going to react. And so we might, we might naively think, well, we can form a methyl radical or a hydrogen radical equally with equal likelihood. Mm -hmm. But in fact, forming that hydrogen radical is highly unlikely because that step is very, very endothermic with a, uh, um, an energy of plus 89 kilojoules associated with it as uh, compared to the plus seven kilojoules for forming a methyl radical. So comparing these numbers, you can just see that the pathway that is the lowest energy is much more likely to occur. So if there is a pathway that is 7 kilojoules endothermic versus a pathway that's 89 kilojoules endothermic, the pathway that involves less energy is going to happen faster, and so more products are going to accumulate in that pathway. So it's far more likely that we're going to form a methyl radical in this first propagation step than a hydrogen radical, which is just to say that hydrogen radicals are highly unlikely. And I will emphasize that point several times throughout this section when we're writing our mechanisms, that we should not be writing hydrogen radicals because they are very high energy and they are highly unlikely.